This is episode 7 of UK Hardcore Interviews and today we're going back to Pelbu of Knuckledust and Ruction Records. In part 2 of my interviews with Pelbu, we look at how Pelbu got into hardcore in the late 90s and experiencing hardcore before the internet. Part 3 will be centred around Knuckledust and Ruction Records, so today's is mainly focused on Pelbu's own experience with hardcore. We do discuss subjects including suicide and mental health issues at around the 20 minute mark, so your discretion is advised. I didn't really know anyone that was into hardcore. Yeah. It was I was I was into like rock music and stuff, like I say when I first got into rock and heavier music it was stuff like Bon Jovi and shit, you know, just guitar yeah. music like that. I like the sound of it. And um Motley Crue, I used to love Motley Crue, Megadeth and um shit like that. Um Amphrax yeah. and you know, all that early stuff. And um many we had a uh, metal and rock magazines like um Kerrang and Raw obviously yeah. and the odd time there might be a little feature on a hardcore band or something like a biohazard at the time maybe was coming up, propane, sick of it all. So I'd be like, alright, this looks interesting. They look a bit different or whatever, so I check it out and then I hear it and I'm just like, Well, read the lyrics and the lyrics just make make sense to me, you know yeah. what I mean? And then obviously the singing is just better than the fucking cock rock style as well, you know yeah. what I mean? Just more <laughs> yeah, straight to the point. So I was like, Wow, this this is my shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm hooked now. Just delving deeper into it. Um yeah, and then make contact with people like um Ian Glasper obviously. Cause I used to do a little um because all this music that I liked and I, I, I couldn't see anyone around me that was kind of into it yeah. I just kind of cut out old fanzines that I had from America and worked with the adverts of the releases that I liked and I stuck it all on an A4 piece of paper and I just go get that photocopy the double sided thing and I'll just be handing it out to people in the hope that they might like it and yeah. then maybe there'll be someone else that I could go to a show with or something <laughs> or you know we help support something uh, or try to build something here and yeah I met some people through, through, through doing that that yeah I probably would never have yeah. come across and still to this day good people good friends of mine and um, yeah I think that kind of helped a bit because there weren't really that much going on yeah hardcore wise I remember going to shows that advertise as hardcore and they'll be like more melodic post hardcore yeah. bands in- English bands as well so but it just wasn't my cup of tea you know what I mean yeah. it just didn't do it for me I wanted that hard shit being a young yeah. you know lost young boy <laughs> and um, yeah just kicked off from that when I met the knuckle dust guys really and that kind of fueled a bit of a fire around us with the people that we knew and like I was saying the 50 caliber guys who started playing um the war zone show at the underworld was kind of a big point a uh, big moment as well for for, the, for our scene where everyone there I watched the video now yeah everyone there we know but back then none of us knew each other yeah so it was coming it was to the UK is obviously a big thing especially for me I mean I was constantly writing to promoters like MAD and all these other people around the UK yeah. how can we get Warzone over how can we get Warzone over yeah. I didn't have a clue back then I was just yeah. a kid I just wanted <laughs> them to play and I didn't know how to organise gigs or nothing really and um, yeah, I just pestered people constantly and eventually it happened didn't it <laughs> so I was like yeah I'm going and then Stamping Ground were booked to play it but they had to pull out and they said you guys want to play it so I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I was made up, mate. Met Rabies and everyone there. And, um, yeah. That was when we we first met the Nine Bar Boys as well. Oh, okay. Because when we were playing. They must have come across us some somehow musically, you know. And um, that might have been the first time they saw us. But, yeah, we just got chatting. We just connected, really. Yeah. And after that, we used to meet up, go to parties or whatever, and just hang out. And, yeah, yeah from there... Nine Bar kind of formed and we would always play together yeah. then that was it then wherever we went Nine Bar would go yeah. and people kind of just recognised us as this, this group of kids that were just like like oddballs you know what I mean everyone's just so different from each other yeah. but you're all just hanging together all the time really tight knit and just smoking weed everywhere you know what I mean just getting black up everywhere and so um, they, that's why they called us the London Black Up Crew and back then as well some of the guys were into like graffiti and stuff so mm. you know they're always hitting up walls and trains and yeah. that and you see LBU popping up all over Stockwell and other spots and that and it kind of added to the, the mystery of it I guess yeah. in a way <laughs> so I remember one time I was just walking down um, 
Tottenham Court Road, and some some dude comes up to me. He's like, "Oh, you're 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 the singer from Knuckle. That's right. You know the guys from Nine Bar. Yeah, yeah. I write the man that do graffiti. And this kid's obviously a writer as well. Yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah. Look, look. He pulls me to this little. It's, it's on the main road. Yeah, a little alleyway just um off Tottenham Court Road. And he's like, start spraying up this thing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. writing my name up there and writing some <laughs> other thing. And I'm I'm there with my missus thinking, right, man. This guy's like proper bait. Like, you know, in the middle of Tottenham Court Road. <laughs> We're just standing there, just like pretending we're just cuddling away while he's doing this thing. And he was like, Yeah, 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 look, I'll do this for you guys. And I, I was just like, Well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but obviously, the Nine boys were involved in that scene as well. Yeah. And from from that, I, 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 I could tell that, yeah, they were influencing people as well, you know, doing the art side of things. And yeah, Nine Bar playing as well, you know, that always brought good vibes, yeah. as it does today. <laughs> I used to go to shows on my own because all my boys from around here they're all into like rave music and stuff yeah. and DJ stuff and um, they weren't really into the, the rock stuff after the grunge period they're in, they like the grunge stuff when we were all at school everyone liked it innit yeah. and then um, after that they weren't really into the heavy heavy shit mm. so yeah, I see a show come up I'm like yeah, I'll go down so I had a go down and check it out be there on my own you know and certain shows you go and you, I, I remember seeing like Weimar obviously being a tall tall guy yeah. as he is he's the spot and seeing Nicky and Weimar and that but I never really spoke to them but then going to shows regularly you start seeing the same people again and yeah. again and obviously then when they called me up about the, um, trying out for the band mm. and I went down and I see them and I'm like oh shit I know these guys all, right, <laughs> you know, and that, it all kind of fell into place yeah but um, yeah, the first shows I went to, oh, at the time, they had stuff like um, the Fuck Reading Festival, oh, yeah, okay. which was at Brixton Academy, I remember. And at that time, they started introducing hardcore bands on it, because before that, it was more just punk and that sort yeah. of stuff, punk and noi. And then they were getting bands like Madball to play and other hardcore bands, Stamping Ground was on it. Um, so I'd go down, check that, and hand out like the the flyers I was doing, the newsletter. And I remember meeting the area effect guys down there at night for the first time. Yeah. And um, yeah, they used to draw a lot of people as well, because it was pretty different at the time. Um, I don't know if that was my first show. Um, what was my show? what would have been? I don't know, maybe a Sick of It All show or, or Biohazard. Because we had the Marquee Club mm. on Chain Cross Road back then still. And Madball played there, the first show. Biohazard played there. Sick of It All played there. And they'd always bring like touring bands like Strife or Doggy Dog or Downset as well was touring as well with Biohazard one time. Madball was playing with Mucky Pup and MOD when I see them there for the first time. Spud Monsters, Propane, all them bands were just starting up in that, in that era as yeah, well. Yeah. So those were probably the first shows I started going to yeah. that were more hardcore related. Mm. Like, um, then obviously the, the few local band shows that I mentioned before, yeah. which were like more emo kind of post punk thing, but calling themselves hardcore on a flyer. So I was just like, ah, this ain't for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's probably stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> The biggest name is probably um, Above All. Ah, oh, yeah. At that time, because yeah. I think they they had a deal with Roadrunner as well when I when when I was put, started going to shows, so they were getting on all the support slots for any Roadrunner bands and all them bands on Roadrunner back then. In it, Fire Hazard, Propane, Life of Agony, Marble, they were all like Roadrunner bands when they first come up, yeah. and um. Yeah, so they used to play a lot of the shows, man. Weren't really my cup of tea, to be honest, in the early days. Mm. I mean, later on, the style kind of changed a bit, and yeah, it sounded good. But, um, yeah. They, they built something good in South End, I remember, because I went to a show there once that they were headlining, and the place was round. Yeah. The vibes were, were nice as well, you know mm. what I mean? So, uh, they did good stuff, but I don't think it really got too good for them in London. Yeah. But, at that time, there wasn't really a London scene, let's mm. say so. But yeah, I don't, I don't believe I put them on. It must have been before, yeah, easily before Knuckles was about. Yeah. 
So yeah, otherwise I'm sure I would have put them on if they were still active at the time. <laughs> Nine Bar is always going to be my number one, to be honest. Yeah. You know, the band means so much to me. Yeah. Musically, lyrically, the attitude behind it. So, yeah, it's definitely my big number one. But besides that, yeah. For me, the bands that kind of inspired me the most, I don't know. A lot of the, lot of the early 80s, um, New York hardcore, early 90s, late 80s stuff. Maybe like um, what Back to Basics Records was putting out. A lot of those bands that really inspired me yeah. at the time. The um, New York Hardcore documentary was coming out as well. I remember I got... Um, somehow, I, I must have been in contact with one of them or something in America. Because I, I, I managed to get a VHS copy of like the trailer for it. Mm. So, you know, watching this is only like three or four minutes long and that. But... I played to the boys in Knuckles and that, and they're just watching it. Everyone's just glued to the TV, watching them doing a violent dance in in, yeah. in New York and that. You know what I mean? And we're just like, oh, this is just next level shit. You know what I mean? So at one of the festivals we did at um, the Standard, I took down the TV, I took down the video player and that, and I, I just put it on for people to yeah. to watch. Yeah, so we'd never seen nothing like that at that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because there was no internet, it weren't even getting documented anyway. You yeah. know what I mean? And this guy decided to do this documentary. So, yeah, we're watching it and everyone's just like enthralled by it. Like, just the violence, the sheer violence, yeah. but it, it was the, the music we're into, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like 25 to Life and bands like that. So, yeah, everyone probably got into it. And, um, yeah, I think that, that helped usher in that era of violent dancing yeah. into the UK as well, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, things kind of snowballed from there. Nothing's great. I mean, yeah. look how great the northern scene is nowadays. Yeah, uh, it's probably I'd say it's probably stronger than like what we have down south. Mm. You know, with the amount of bands that they got and activity that's happening at the moment, and constantly new new areas popping up and coming up. Yeah, and I imagine Outbreak had a, a great deal to do with that, with bringing people together and you know the sort of bands that they were pushing on people, and still do. You know what I mean? Yeah. How else are they going to get up there? Sometimes you know. Yeah, I mean, they always had good stuff in the north when we were first starting out. I remember it was big punk influence, well, same as us yeah. down south at the time, because there weren't really much hardcore, hardcore. But, um, yeah, I used to notice that certain bands were really tight and they'd always play together and that night. Yeah. And obviously they'd introduce us to each other and then it just naturally just progressed as well. And yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's good. I always liked the northern scene. I always used to love going up north to play shows and that. And yeah. I remember the first time we went up there, we we got a coach up there, and um, all the other bands that were playing were like Vegan Straight Edge, or Hardline, or whatever they were they were at the time. And we'd be these drunk Londoners going up there, just like you know, we'd play, then chill out, and just watching everything happen around us. And then it just seemed like everyone was just arguing with each other, like you know, intellectual arguments and stuff like this, and <laughs> about everything. And we would just be like, okay, <laughs> we just we we'll stay out of it. We're not intelligent <laughs> enough for this. And um, yeah, it was quite funny my first experience up there but um, yeah all, all my friends I mean even before Knuckle Dust I used to go to Sheffield a lot oh, just yeah. to see shows because like touring bands would play Bradford, Rio's and obviously in London and I, I'd be like yeah I'll check the London show I want to see and see them again so I'll just go up to Sheffield made some mates through tape trading mm. and um, like, all vegan straight ages and um, I'd go stay with them for the weekend and then we'd all go up to Bradford and um, check out the show and then I'd hang out there for a little bit in Sheffield and yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was good times, man. I was, you know, really enjoyed it. So. Yeah, I've been really busy with that recently. Oh. Yeah, I've been quite lucky because um, yeah, just people just randomly messaging me saying, you know, would you mind, would you mind singing on the track yeah. for us? And I'm like, yo, man, I'm, I'm honoured that you asked me. You know, and I'm happy to work with bands and. You know, different sound for me as well. Then at least yeah. I can try different things vocally, and it's easy to do nowadays. I just record it in my uh, in my garage at, at the time when in my old place before I moved. I was just doing it in my garage. So I've got a decent mic, and the software is easy enough to get hold of. Yeah. So for recording vocals, piece of piss, just email it over. And next thing you know, you got bands all over the world 
my voice on it. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm enjoying doing it. You know, like I say, I'm learning myself. You know, I'm yeah. trying different things. So. But you know what it is? It's like when we first got into music and the hardcore bands we were listening to, mm. all of them sounded different like that in a way. You know, yeah. all the vocalists sounded different. They were doing different little things. Mm. It might be a minute little different thing, but it, it made that stand out, yeah. you know, in a different way. And to me, that's that's how it should be, you know. Yeah. Not, not just every band coming out with the, vo with the vocalist sound like Hatebreed, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the same sort of monotone, like sound yeah. or, or, or um, vocal patterns that they use or whatnot. You know, I mix it up. I make it interesting for myself. Yeah. If anything, I don't care about other people. You know, got it. You know? Obviously, my inspiration as well comes from like dancehall music, reggae music, which is mainly what I listen to nowadays. I don't yeah. really listen to too much hardcore, to be honest. Yeah, because you know. I, no, I know what I like and yeah I might check out some new bands now and again but you know when so I'm at work I can't listen to hardcore music yeah. when I'm driving and it makes me too aggressive so you know, I tend to just listen to reggae music and dancehall but yeah that inspires me to do what I do a great yeah. deal especially with the, the message and you know I wouldn't call it a, what we do a political thing but I definitely um, like a, a social commentary if anything yeah. in, in a basic form because it's only hardcore music, you know, the songs ain't that long, so you can't expand on things too yeah. much, but it suits my style in a way yeah. and kind of helped me to grow that style as well because mm. of, of that factor. Yeah. I see a lot of bands coming out and the whole imagery and everything is violence, you know, like, yeah. and you know, they're not the sort of people that are going to go and commit fucking murders and shit anyway. Exactly. So they're promoting that imagery and stuff. And I'm not knocking it because yeah. I, do, I do it myself as well and a lot of the reggae dancehall music that I listen to is some gangster shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. They talk about shooting and killing and that, but, you know, yeah, get creative, you know, and, you know, you're, you're doing something, yeah, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, in essence, it's just getting shit off your chest, isn't it? And yeah. It, political situations are, are something that means something to you and you know you feel strongly enough to communicate that then yeah. why not yeah. there's absolutely no reason to do it yeah. you know what I mean no one can tell you to, what to do in a hardcore band it's your band yeah yeah. maybe some people might not like it and might not put you on at certain shows and that but fuck them what, you know do you need them anyway yeah do do what you, makes you happy yeah you know I mean for me a lot of the lyrics that I was writing were very personal to me, like experiences that I've had, and you know, obviously, I've seen a lot of suffering in my family as well. And, um, in the middle, middle to early part of Knocker's career, it was um, my my father committed suicide. Sure. So at the time, obviously, that inspired me to write certain way and certain mm. songs, yeah. and um, yeah. It just seemed the, the natural thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, As I'm not very good at maybe talking out my feelings you know yeah as a stereotypical man <laughs> but um yeah i just found it easier to just write it in a poetic form to music and then when i do sing it then it you know helps me put those thoughts into some sort of order and yeah. you know um maybe not totally help me deal with all of it but at least you know it gives me some sort of confidence in the fact that yeah all right yeah i've been through this and i can see different sides of it and yeah yeah definitely hardcore music is is ideal for for, for anything like that you know yeah as is any any form of expression art music dance in my mind but being the people we are then hardcore is, was there for us we didn't really have much much options yeah, I, I can understand it takes a lot of courage to, you know, speak about these things yeah. as well. And it's just mad. Yeah. In this day and age, it seems like the numbers every year, just more and more people, you know. Yeah. And, and even before, it's like... I'm not even sure most of the the um, incidents have been reported right, you know. So yeah. their figures are, are I, I don't think it would be true anyway. You know what I mean? I think yeah. it's a, the the rate of suicide is a lot lot higher than it, it, they say it is. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, 
who's what's the right answer, you know? Yeah. You know. We've got to got to try and help each other. I know in society right now it's not really designed <laughs> with that in mind. Yeah. You know, they can, we've got to work so hard that you're kind of is isolated and just got to go with it and, you know, get that tunnel vision just to survive, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it, I'm learning, yeah, you really got to not neglect yourself mm. as much, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy, but, yeah. We do need to try something. I mean, I, I honestly haven't got the answer. I don't know what, what yeah. I could do, you know? I mean, for me... When my dad was gonna kill himself, I knew that that evening I was with him, and I spent that evening chatting to him. And growing up, I never really spoke to him, or well, he never really told me much about his past. Growing up as a kid, which is a bit weird, you know, I thought, yeah. but I didn't think nothing of it. Didn't know no better. But that night, he started telling me all about his past, how he came to the country when he was a kid, how he's, he he was raised by his uncle in the navy, and all this stuff. And I was just like, wow, well, okay. And um. Obviously, as the night progressed, then things got a bit too much for me, and um, yeah, I had to leave. Yeah. And um, then I get a phone call the next day, and my brother's telling me, "Hey, he's, he's gassed himself in a garage with their exhaust fumes." So I'm just thinking, why didn't I stay there? Why didn't I stay there longer? Just not leave, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's know. these things like even if you know, even if you stayed that night. It might. It probably would have still happened another night. Like he was a very stubborn man, I know, and yeah. he had his mindset. And he, yeah, I mean, I know I couldn't stop him. I know that, but yes, yeah, you know what can you do? I mean, so now I'm thinking about it more, seeing so many young people as well, and friends of mine that are going down, that have been down this path and sharing these experiences. Yeah, knowing people that have taken their own lives, and I don't know. It's just like yesterday, I mentioned like. If anyone wants to record music, I mean, there's not much I can offer anyone really, you know what I mean? But at least there's music if, if you're interested in recording or want to have something that you want to write and say on music, then yeah, I can help with that. Yeah, you know, I've got a microphone, I've got a laptop, I can plug it in, record it. I've got people that write music, you know what I mean? Constantly churning out music. You don't have to start a band, you can just record the music. Yeah. And do it, and then you've got something there, you know, and if it does help someone, then... Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I guess we saw the um, the birth of the old internet, like forum, online boards, and sort yeah. of chat rooms and stuff. When it comes to hardcore re related stuff, and yeah, in the in early days, it was it was a strange place, man. Because yeah. I guess. It's a bit like Bill and Ted's, like that film, innit? When someone's chatting yeah. shit on the internet, where you, you'd be like, well, what's he chatting that shit for? Well, I'm going to see him next week at a show. Yeah. <laughs> so you go and see him face to face, and then they just crumble, innit? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just stupid. And we used to take it a bit too personally back then when it first came out, but no one knew how to behave with it. Mm. Nowadays, I don't give a fuck what people say online, to yeah. be honest, you know, because they're hiding behind the screen, I don't give a fuck, you know what I mean? You can say what the fuck they want, don't bother me, don't affect me. But it does affect a lot of people, a lot of young kids are really affected by this, and I can see, like, yeah the age getting younger and younger and it is a way of uh, a form of mental abuse sometimes you know mm. what I mean and yeah when I see some people that I know maybe chatting some nonsense and that and being nasty to people on, uh, online I tell them you got to wind that in yeah you know yeah, if you got a problem you got to speak to them face to face don't have to result to violence but you know I'm sure if you speak you'll probably be like oh well you know I like this guy you know you'll yeah. be best mates after that yeah 